independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. A lot of good things are happening, but I want to thank Mexico. And we do have one other thing that will be announced at the appropriate time. But they have to get approval from their legislative body. What is it? Why are the Mexicans (laughs) denying it then? I don't think they'll be denying it very long. It's all done. Oh, what is it? Oh, did they get me something? Give me a hand, please. What is it? I want to know. It's my son. My son's ninth birthday is in three days. And I kind of like give them, you know, little hints for him. Hey, hey. And he's like, Dad, you got to tell me it's killing me. Oh, my God. I got to know. What is it? Oh, what is it, Trump? Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. We need to know. Mm -hmm. We have an agreement on something that uh, they will announce very soon. It's all done. And they have to get approval. And they will get approval. Yeah. He's not telling us. Super, double, sneaky, triple, quadruple, shh, is what it is. That's what it is. It's super, shh, don't need to know. There's some things you need to know, some things you don't need to know. This is one of those you don't need to know. I don't know. We'll figure out what it is sooner rather than later. Nothing, look, the good thing about the whole tariff thing, if there is anything that came out of this that's interesting, is what potentially might happen with asylums. Now, this is something that should be paid attention to. The United States will immediately expand the implementation of the existing migrant protection protocols across its entire southern border. This means that those crossing the U.S. southern border to seek asylum will be rapidly returned to Mexico, where they may await the adjudication of their asylum claims. So there you go. So what that means is you got to apply in Mexico. You have to stay in Mexico while everything is being heard. That is very interesting. That, to me, is something that could be considered a real win. I don't know when this deal was done. Was it done two months ago, three months ago? And he wanted some other stuff put in there, so he decided to go back and ask for a little bit more, and maybe he got it. Was this just a a game that's being played? Quite frankly, it it doesn't matter. It didn't affect anybody. We didn't have any of this that affected anybody. Nobody got hit with a tariff. So we move on with our lives. right? We move on with our lives to much more important things, like, hey, we still need to impeach this guy. House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler says criminal contempt moves against Attorney General William Barr have been postponed after the Justice Department agreed to turn over key underlying evidence from the Mueller report. However, the full House is still expected to vote on a resolution which would clear the way for the Judiciary panel to go to court to seek civil enforcement of the subpoenas for Barr and former White House Counsel Don McGahn. The DOJ documents retain to possible obstruction of justice by President Trump. So what does that mean? Nothing to you. Nothing. They were going to come after him, but then they got some of the stuff that they feel happy about. And they were able to interview John Dean today. If you don't know who John Dean is, because. Right. Because. You're under 60 or 70. Right. John Dean was somebody who was involved with Nixon. Right. Was his attorney. Ended up doing time for Watergate. They brought him in today. So they they, they woke him up. They dusted him off. Where are you guys taking me? Hey, tell us how this is just like Watergate and how we need to go after Trump. I wasn't there. No, just say that you understand that this is exactly like Watergate. Everything here is just like Watergate. This is Watergate to a T. Huh? What? No. And then that's what happened today. We interviewed him. I can't even remember. I think it was a couple years ago. It was not good. But, like, I was asking producer Anthony, why would you, like, what does this have to do with anything? Bringing him in, a guy who's not involved, well, we want to talk about similarities. So, can we bring in, you know, let's talk about, like, let's start interviewing people we'll go back to MacArthurism, right? We can have those hearings again, just to see how this is like something else. That right there is ridiculous. It is ridiculous that they would even do something like that. Just, I sit here and I scratch my head and I thought, Wow. Really, this is like you were so into getting him. This is what it's about. You were so into getting Trump that you're going to bring somebody in who wasn't involved in any way, shape or form. So you can draw a line that says from point A to point B, it's just like this when really it's apples and oranges. Nothing to do. One doesn't has nothing to do with the other. 
We did nothing wrong except create the greatest economy in the history of our country. About that. We did nothing wrong except rebuild our military like nobody's ever seen before. We did that. Uh, we're doing a great job. Our country has never been stronger. Well, you know, again, well, we can all debate those things. The, the military thing, I don't know about the greatest economy, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get behind you on the military thing. When you look at past impeachments, whether it was President Clinton or I guess President Nixon never got there, he left. I don't leave. There's a big difference. I don't leave. Oh, I don't leave. Uh-oh. You know somebody's going to run with that. And say, Did you hear what he said? That essentially means that he's never going to leave. Even if he loses in 2020, the military will back him, and he's never going to leave. I'm just waiting for that. Just never. He's never going anywhere. He's just never going to leave. Ah, get over yourself. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from every single one of you. I am going to watch the basketball game tonight. Could be the final game of the season. The Canadians, there's a good chance they're going to win. Not the Montreal Canadiens. Toronto. How funny is this? How funny is this? Hockey, they haven't won anything forever. I think the, I think Calgary was the last team to win in the uh, Stanley Cup Finals and to win for a Canadian team. But Toronto, potentially tonight, could win. How crazy is that? It's because they play different rules up there. Square basketball. Mm -hmm. Three second shot clock. That's it. Crazy rules. We don't even understand them. 323 538 2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. So, over the weekend, everybody who's anybody headed to uh, Iowa to, to, to lay down the gauntlet. This is where you have to be right now. You have to be in Iowa. This is where it, it you know, we're going to have the first debate in a few weeks' time. But you've got to make sure that you've got to you got to make your stand here if you're on the Democratic side, and what that stand is going to be. Some people are surging; others have never taken off. That is a little bit of a warning sign for Joe Biden. On the other hand, he's got the widest support across the party of any of the candidates. He's in some ways for a lot of Democrats the safe choice. The candidate who's best positioned to beat uh, President Trump, not necessarily the choice of those who are looking to really back a candidate with some passion. But he has slipped a bit since the last poll. The other big news there is that uh, Bernie Sanders has slipped a bit since the last poll and pretty big surge for Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and uh, Elizabeth Warren's doing pretty well as well. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a surge there, and I will say this, though. When you look at the numbers, over 65, Biden dominates. And why that's important is because people over 65 show up and vote. That's why. A younger generation, he's further behind, right? Behind Buttigieg and Warren and, 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 and old Bernie there. And Harris even has a little run. Beto's really fallen off. I don't even, I, we need to send out a search party for Beto. I feel sorry for him. But over 65 matters because of the fact that they do show up. They're consistent. You know what you're going to get from them. If they say they're going to show up, they're going to show up. The younger generation, they talk a big game. They go out. They're activists. They, they, they do all the things that they're supposed to do. If their person isn't in the field that they want, they take their ball and go home. And sometimes, even if that person is in there, eh, they just don't get to it. 65 gets to it. 25, not always. Well, is that real? Yeah, that's very real. That's very real. Now, how is anybody going to do with it? Because this is what I want to see. This is what I'm curious about. So you go and you talk the Green New Deal. And you go and you placate the, the extreme left of the party. Because that's what you have to do. You have to kiss the, the Green New Deal ring, and you have to, to, to do that. But normally, in, in, when you're out there in the world of campaigning, in your primaries, you are running to the right or to the left of the center. Maybe not to these extremes, but you are there. Then when you get the nomination, because you feel like, hey, you're going to be stuck with me anyways, you can run where you feel you're comfortable. And if that is the far left, then so be it. But if it's more center left, what are they going to do? Run away from Biden? I don't want any part of that. It's possible. But I doubt it. I mean, they did, you know, Bernie's people didn't follow Hillary's people. They weren't a fan of Hillary. And he didn't really push it. The way that I think a lot of people, in, and I've seen in a couple of town halls, people have asked him, why didn't you? He's like, oh, I tried everything I possibly could. I went out and I campaigned for it. But he didn't really, right? And rightly so. I wouldn't have either, the way that they treated him. But in saying that, 
if Biden gets it, do you think he's going to stay out in the far left? I don't think he will. I think he'll come back into the center. Now, he'll still be center left and probably a little bit left than he would be normally. But I think he'll definitely gravitate away from the the far left of everybody gets a free job and everybody gets this and everybody gets that. I think he'll come in and because he's been there long enough, too, that he, he understands what Washington's about. He understands the lobbyists and the games he has to play and the money that he needs to raise. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. Hope you're doing well on this beautiful day. So, guys, Father's Day is coming up. Are you a gadget dad? You one of those? Yeah? Gadget dads. Let me tell you something perfect for you. Home security system from Blink. It is incredible. Guys, we worry about what? Well, we worry about whether or not stuff's going on in our house. And guess what? That's where this is a no-brainer. It really, really is. You're going to save 20% on all indoor camera systems. Blink's motion-activated cameras are wire-free, set up in minutes, and run in two lithium batteries. Last up to two years. They've got live feed options, so Dad can monitor in the home, check in on all the stuff that's going on there from family to pets. It's a great way to protect your family and your stuff. No monthly contracts. Totally affordable. And right now, Father's Day, June 16th, that's this week, they've got something amazing for you. Blink indoor camera systems, 20% off. Home security just got easier thanks to Blink. Get and score this perfect Father's Day gift by going to blinkprotect.com slash Benson. Blinkprotect.com slash Benson. Blinkprotect.com slash Benson. Blink cameras are also available at Amazon and Best Buy. Blink is an Amazon company, and it works with Alexa. Chad Benson Show. No fake outrage here. Just the real thing. The Chad Benson Show. Witnesses say the gunman jumped off a motorcycle, walked into the Dominican Republic nightclub, and shot Ortiz at point-blank range in the back. The bullet exited through his stomach. Surveillance video shows people in the club scattering for safety. Police say the gunman was captured and beaten by an angry crowd. Before going into surgery, a local reporter says Ortiz told emergency room doctors, quote, please don't let me die. I'm a good man. Ah, who would shoot Big Poppy, the baseball star? Who would shoot the big poppy? And the thing is, so he is, he lost his gallbladder, some of his intestine. I guess his liver was pierced too, and I don't know what, what, what exactly went on there. He was in intensive care. Uh, it is, do you guys understand, like, baseball players in the Dominican Republic, they're not like like players here. Like players here, if they're in your city, right? You know, you got, you, you know, if you, you like LeBron, you don't. It, it, they're gods over there. They are, they are worshipped. Somebody had a beef with the big poppy, and they just strolled up on him and shot him. It, I mean, this this guy's the happiest guy, and he's just he's beloved in Boston, but he's just happy go lucky. You can't find anybody in baseball to say a bad thing about him except for pitchers who had to face him. David Ortiz is an idol in the Dominican Republic. He is, you know, considered one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But not only that, the work that he has done for the people of the Dominican Republic, specifically with children, his foundation has helped a lot of children in the Dominican Republic. And he is just a beloved, like a larger-than-life sports figure. You know how beloved he is in Boston. Just imagine that for an entire country. Yeah. So he rolled up on him, and they whooped that guy's ass, by the way. They were lucky. The police got there in just enough time for him not to be killed. Because he, uh, he had some bleeding in the brain and busted up knee and leg, and he was, he was whooped up on. They, didn't, they, they did not hold back. They did not hold back. And, and around the world, like, we don't see it, but you'll see soccer players in particular – their family members in certain parts of the country will be kidnapped, right? Because they're they're forced to pay a a ransom to get them out. Players who've made mistakes, in particular, uh, Pablo Escobar and Andreas Escobar. Escobar was the player who scored an own goal against the U.S. in the '94 World Cup. Colombia was. I was at the game. I turned to my friend Kenny Kenny Hodge. I turned to Kenny after he scored the goal. I looked right at him and said, that guy's dead. And two weeks later, while the World Cup was still going on, Columbia had turned home and he was killed. 
So in other parts of the world, it's, yeah, it's dangerous. But in Dominican, this is weird. It's just a trip. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from each and every one of you. Still trying to figure out why John Dean, who was part of the Watergate scandal, who did some time part of the Watergate scandal, called today to testify, obviously does not like the President of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At a memorial event for David Hamburg, Speaker Pelosi and I had a chance to discuss impeachment. Mr. Dean, who wrote that? I did. 19, uh, excuse me, one month ago, May 11th, 2019. Haven't we been too long in not giving Trump a meaningful moniker? Should it be deranged on, deadbeat on, demagogued on? Thoughts, please, comments. Mr. Dean, who wrote that? I assume that was mine. It was. Yeah, it was yours. But you're brought in today having nothing to do with the case, having nothing to do with Donald Trump, not liking Donald Trump, so you could draw, what, parallels between Watergate and Trump? In many ways, the Mueller report is to President Trump what the so-called Watergate Roadmap, officially titled The Grand Jury Report and Recommendation Concerning Transmission of Evidence to the House of Representatives, was to President Richard Nixon. I'm still trying to figure out again why you're there. (laughs) Are you a part of this? No. Were you in the Trump campaign? No. Are you a Russian oligarch? No. Are you, were you part of the Mueller investigation? No. (laughs) Just still trying to figure this, trying to come, trying to figure, I get you don't like Trump and I get that other people don't like Trump. I'm just trying to figure out why everybody's together here. You guys don't mind. Just as a, as a taxpayer looking at my elected officials, not doing things that they need to be doing because they're too busy having uh, half assery uh, hearings that have nothing to do with the average person trying to get something done in their world. And uh, you guys are talking to somebody whose sell by date was long ago. Three, two, three, five, three, eight, twenty four, twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's the straight pride parade. Or is it Chad Benson Show? Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. I think the president has completely overblown what he purports to have achieved. These are agreements that Mexico had already made in some cases months ago. They might have accelerated the timetable, uh, but, but by and large, the president achieved nothing except to jeopardize the most important trading relationship that the United States of America has. Well, let's hold on there, Beto. I'm glad, glad to see you're still out there. We had to set a search party out because Beto had kind of disappeared. But what did happen in this new trade negotiation slash tariff threats? Well... New York Times is like, this thing's been negotiated months ago. Nothing was on paper. That's fair to say, right? Maybe it was negotiated months ago. Nothing was on paper. Second thing, though, is what they are saying is something that was thrown in there, which is the new asylum law that they want Mexico to follow, which is if you're coming to America to apply for asylum, you've got to do it in Mexico. You can't do it here. And that's the thing that has been the Achilles heel in this mess that we have at the border right now, which is people have learned how to work our laws. They come here, they apply for asylum, they know exactly what's going to happen. And now in many cases, they don't even have a plan. The plan is just get to America and then we'll wing it from there. And that is not a good plan. That is not a very good plan. And they know exactly what they're doing. There are, I mean, when I was down at the border, I will tell you this. When you're talking to people, they know they, they, they're getting pamphlets. They're seeing billboards. They're hearing commercials. They know exactly what's going on and how to use the system that we have set up against us. I want to see people come here legally. I don't think that's a wrong thing. If we do not control our borders, then what are we doing? What are we doing? Do we make it easier for people to apply for asylum? Do we change some of the rules when it comes to applying for asylum? 
We can debate all that all day long. But we never get to that point because we have two parties that have no interest in actually solving this at all. We need a leader in this country who's going to make sure that we fight for those farmers, for the American workers, that we strengthen our ties with Mexico, and that we secure our connection with the rest of the world, not through walls or putting kids in cages, but by investing in solutions in Central America to ensure that no family ever has to make that 2,000-mile journey because they're fleeing the deadliest countries on the face of the planet That all sounds great. But what about people in Yemen? Right. What about people in South Sudan? What about people across the globe who are struggling just as much? Well, it's totally different, Chad. And here's the other thing we need to I don't want a nation build in a place where corruption is so vast that for every dollar we get a dollar disappears. So we give them a dollar. Boom. Gone. And it doesn't trickle down to anybody else. We'd be better off just handing them all wads of cash and sending them home than giving the money to a corrupt government that doesn't have anything but their own interest in mind. And that's what has happened over and over again through Central America. And it's frustrating. 323-538-2423. At Chad Menson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. So their straight pride parade, which, you know, hey, they, they're, they're no longer... They no longer have Brad Pitt as their as their I guess their their mascot. Where he's been saying, "Yeah, get rid of me. I don't want you on there." Because you know it's all about nobody could take a joke, kind of scenario. Uh, and uh, the mayor had to come out and issue a statement talking about the straight pride parade in Baston. Walsh explained in a Twitter thread Thursday saying, permits to host a public event are granted based on operational feasibility, not based on values or endorsements of beliefs. The city of Boston cannot deny a permit based on organization's values. This straight pride parade doesn't, he says, going on here yet have a permit, but is working to amend their application for permits to host a public event. Whatever outside groups may try to do, our values won't change. I invite each and every person to stand with us and show that love will always prevail. Join us in celebration this Saturday for the Boston Pride Parade and in the fight for progress and equality for all. According to the Straight Pride Group's president, John Hugo, the parade, once it's permitted, would be in the last uh, Saturday in August. So they want it. Last Saturday in August, Milo Yiannopoulos, I guess, is going to be what, like the Grand Marshal, which right there just showed you exactly what this is all about. And I think they've really made... No bones that they're having fun with it. And John Hugo's talking about it. He is the organizer of the Straight Pride Parade. Joining me now is one of those organizers, John Hugo. John, how are straight guys oppressed? Oh, well, if we talk about our issues, you know, like we don't want to see uh, children having sex changes because the parents don't like the gender of their child. We're, we're middle, immediately called villains in the, in the mainstream media, things like that. We're more than three guys, by the way. We've yeah. got a couple hundred people already, and we're being deluged with emails. Half of them hate us, and half of them love us. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what you're going to get in this world now. Half is going to hate you, half is going to love you, and you're always going to be deemed to be evil because you're not on the side of the social justice and virtue signaling, right? And, and it goes back to, once again, if you have a belief in something, the other side wants to make it anti you're anti-climate change, you're anti-science, you're anti-gay, you're anti-Muslim, whatever it is, and it's ridiculous. You can, Look, you can have a belief, and it cannot be anti, it could just be my belief. That's all it is, it's my belief, right? Not anti-you, don't want to see you oppressed, don't want to see you thrown in jail, I want to see you succeed and have opportunities in life, and I want to make sure that those opportunities are out there for you. I'm not anti-anything, I just have my beliefs. Well, you know, what is wrong with celebrating straight pride? It is a sexual orientation. Do you guys have your own straight pride flag? Actually, it's a pink and blue flag with the symbol for male and female on it. Okay. The city of Boston actually has denied us the right to do it. We use the exact same language, there you go, that the LGBTQ community um, used, and they were approved and got their flag for seven days. We only wanted a couple hours. So the Mass Commission Against Discrimination has now opened a case against them. Ooh, that's big. Do you think you can have a straight pride parade in Palm Springs or San Francisco, Los Angeles, West Hollywood, right? Orlando. I would do it just out of hilarity. And the whole thing would be we're going to set up, the, and it's going to be like a half a block. 
and it, and and coming is optional. <laughs> you, you don't have to come. Like a lot of the things we do here in the Chad Benson show is like it's optional. Mostly it's not, right? It's like we won't have a sit in, basically sit in front of your couch and we're allowed. That's where we're gonna protest. We're gonna protest as the protesters by not protesting. It's it's that it's that kind of thing. Are you just doing this as a joke to be provocative or do you really oh, feel this no, strongly? No, no, about no, no. We, we think we think this is great. We have we, we knew we were going to trigger the left, and that's why we call this super happy fun America. Because now you know the whole Hollywood elite is having a meltdown. The view that Stephen Colbert, who stopped being funny as soon as he became a show so for the left, you- <laughs> which is true, which is absolutely true. Again, you're not on the right side of it. Colbert and everybody attacking you, and everybody say, "Oh yeah, yeah." It's that virtue signaling that drives me crazy. Have some fun with it. Why can't we do it? I saw you saw people like apologizing for being straight and white and male. Why would I would never ask anybody to apologize. If you're trans, I would never say apologize for that. No, be who you are. And I'm wrong with that. And every once in a while. And how many times do we say this on the Chad Benson show? Have a sense of humor. Laugh about it a little bit. Right. Laugh about it a little bit. Go to the pride parade and go to the other pride parade. Show lots of pride in all those parades. Or better yet, don't go to any parades because they're all silly. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's the Macy's Day Parade or the Rose Parade, they're all silly. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos has just become the head of our parade, and we've got a lot of um, gay people who are helping us. We've got gay allies. Yeah, but, because uh, Milo is gay, super, right? He is gay. So, He's going to be our grand marshal. We just thought it'd be a lot of fun to have are him. Are you sure you want to associate yourself with Milo? He's probably one I of the most he's... controversial people out there. Oh, like this isn't controversial? We're breaking the internet. Yeah, you guys are. And you're going to get lots of hate. Because that's what we do. We send hate. That's all we do. Like, here's a perfect example. So Friday, Anthony sends me, producer Anthony sends me this thing about California and uh, vanity plates. Right, so they're vanity plates, and what they're allowing people to have for vanity plates, and what they're not allowing people to have for vanity plates. And I thought it was funny, so I was looking at it, and then I went underneath to see the conversations that were being had because that is as much the fun as anything. And the way that people were attacking each other over vanity plates, and the hate that they spew, is just—I mean, you're just sitting there, and I'm like, my God. The F you and then F this and then and this is all over vanity plates that people are deciding whether you should or shouldn't have in California and what people are, you know, uh, one guy had fishing for tuna or something like that. And, you know, they were saying, well, it's a sexual connotation for chasing women. But they went online and found out this guy fishes all over the world for tuna. This is what he likes to do. But they said no to him. And, and you're like, OK, whatever. And then another guy had blank Trump and this, that and the other. And it's just, but the way that people attack each other, it doesn't matter anymore. You just choose a side nowadays, and somebody will find a reason to hate you. Because that's, and we've made it easier than ever before to hate each other. It's it's nuts. It is absolutely nuts. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Another article in CNBC about male managers and female workers and another article that shouldn't surprise people 60 percent of male managers now say they're uncomfortable participating in work activities with women and i don't blame them i do not blame them one bit i get it i absolutely get it why people don't want that well, Chad, that's not very fair. No, what you want here's the thing. Mentoring is so vitally important. I don't care if you're a man or woman. To be mentored by somebody is so important. But we're also in a situation where everybody is afraid right now. And when your career and your livelihood's on the line, and it only takes one slip up in this day and age to get yourself to the point where you are screwed, and the slip up could be I said something to somebody else that had nothing to do with what you think I thought I said, but it doesn't really matter because you took it a certain way. All of a sudden, boom, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I get it. I get why that has happened. And by the way, this is an increase of almost 40%. Senior level management uh, men also say they're 12 times more likely to be hesitant about one-on-one meetings with a junior woman, right? More than they are. And nine times more likely to be hesitant to travel with a junior 
And a junior means not like a 22-year-old, but somebody who is, so you're management and they're below you. They could be your age, they could be a little bit younger, they could even be a little bit older, but they're at the point where it's like, nope, not going to do it. And I get that. That's It sucks. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. But I get it. I do. If it's your job, if it's your livelihood, and you're worried about something, wouldn't you take as much precaution as possible? 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show. Here's your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Oh, my pillow. I've had mine for ugh, almost two years. Before I had my pillow, this is how I slept. Not well. Now that I have got my pillow, I sleep really well. In fact, last night, I got about six and a half hours sleep, which, and for me, that is amazing because I went, I went to sleep very late. I was doing a bunch of things, and I woke up extra early today because uh, I wanted to get a little workout in and stuff before I came into work. It's one of those things where it's how I'm sleeping that's incredible. I mean, I sleep. You can be in bed for 10 hours. You can toss and turn and not get any sleep. You can be in bed for six hours and sleep like a rock. That was me. 100% machine washable and dryable, made in the USA. And here's the great thing about my pillow right now. They're offering you a 60-day money-back guarantee, and they're doing something for my listeners they've never done before. Lowest price ever offered. Two premium pillows, $69.98. That's less than $70, bucks, $34.99 per pillow. All you have to do is go to MyPillow.com, use promo code Benson. That's MyPillow.com, promo code Benson. Two premium pillows, $69.98, free shipping. You can go to MyPillow.com, use promo code Benson, or call 800-983-4975 and use the promo code Benson. It's the Chad Benson Show. You go, boy. This isn't about right or left. This is just about right and wrong. Right you are, Chad. The Chad Benson Show. We're going on a trip. Box office bragging rights, such as they are, go to The Secret Life of Pets 2. It opened in first with $47.1 million, just shy of the $50 million it was expected to make, but less than half of the $104.3 million the 2016 original opened with. She'll kill us all. Worst news for Dark Phoenix, the X-Men franchise finale posted a $33 million opening. Good for second, but far below expectations and the worst ever X-Men movie opening. Oh. What are they going to do? They're running out of comic books. Did you see, what was it, Swamp Thing? So Swamp Thing was is a comic book. Then it was a movie in the 80s starring Adrian Barbeau, who was kind of like a 70s and 80s kind of pinup for a while. And so they brought it out. And, of course, it had to be a little bit darker and totally different. And it was to be about... <laughs> I think there was global warming and all kinds of stuff. It got one episode. I think it was on Netflix, and they're like, we cancel it. <laughs> wow, you got to really suck. Or CW or something. To get fired from the CW, you got to really try. You got to really try. I'm just saying. So, uh, yeah, the the X-Men movies, they're kind of done. And uh, I don't, uh, I just, what do you do at this point in time? Because there is so many competing superhero movies. Where's the fresh stuff? You go back to the well for as long as you can. And you continue to do that. But people are looking for fresh stuff. And if your ideas come from comic books and you don't seem to have anything fresh, I think we've got a brain drain in Hollywood. Something I would pay for. Was Justin Bieber bored Justin Sunday night or who knows? But he tweeted out of nowhere, I want to challenge Tom Cruise to a fight in the octagon. He went on to basically call Cruise a chicken, saying if Cruise didn't take the fight, he's scared and will never live it down. Bieber then asked UFC president Dana White if he'd put on the fight if there is a fight. So far, no response from Cruz, who's 56 and 5'7", by the way. You need to walk away. Bieber's 25 and 5'9". Oh, so you got a 5'9", Bieber, but he's wiry, though. Like, Cruz is a little bit stockier, probably weighs 20 pounds more than Bieber, but Bieber's wiry, and people that work out with him in New York at the gym, he's boxed out for a while, said the dude could, the guy can fight. He's a little wiry, right? But at the same time, Tom Cruise is Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher's a badass. You don't mess with Jack Reacher, right? You don't want to do that. So who do you take, right? Do you take the Beebs? Do you take Tom Cruise? 56, 25? Ugh, that's a big age gap right there. That'd be a tough one. That'd be a tough one. I think... 
think it might get, well, it depends. Is Jack Reacher showing up? Because if Jack Reacher's showing up, it's Jack Reacher. If Tom Cruise shows up, mm, and is this a religious battle? Is this Scientology versus Christianity? I think that's a fair question to ask as well. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. People are texting in about the straight parade. I would never listen to a word that guy says. I still think it's a joke, people. All right? That's all I'm saying. I do believe these guys are having fun. That's why they're called Super, ha- super Happy Fun America. Every once in a while, you got to look at something and go, yeah, it's kind of funny, and we move on with it. We don't need to overthink some things as we tend to do in this country, and try to find out where all the bad things are happening and who's being offended, right? Everybody's always offended. We don't always have to be offended. Sometimes we can laugh. If Milo is your master of ceremonies, you can laugh a little bit. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Do love hearing from you. Check out the uh, podcast at thechadshow.com as well. It is The Chad Benson Show. This is The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. If we believe we need to combat climate change and save our planet for future generations, we must take on the lies of the fossil fuel industry. Ah, the man, the myth, the legend. Bernie this weekend out in Iowa. Biden skipped it. People are upset with him. Tomorrow he's going to hold a special rally, and Trump's going to have a rally there. It's going to be competing rallies, and I'm sure we'll have to figure out whose crowd was bigger, because that really matters. But it is interesting that Sanders is out there. Sanders has led the charge for socialism, 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 uh, and he's been the only one. Now that lane is very, very big, and the younger generation is definitely gravitating to it, as are more women gravitating towards socialism. The Daily Show took this on, I thought, in a very funny way. Socialism is totally on trend. I popped Somali and hit the street to find out why, even though the olds hate it, the kids love socialism. Uh, I think socialism is great. I think you should definitely help whoever you could at any situation. I f*** with socialism just because I f*** with anything that's helping black people out. Okay, so you're socialism curious. Yeah, well, I'm in college. Right. Do you hate billionaires? Low-key, yeah. You look at Jeff Bezos, he doesn't look human. I think the idea of socialism is on point. It's on point, but it's not real. It's not real. Right? It's not real. And in fact, here's something. As Bernie always talks about Denmark. Denmark's very interesting. So last Wednesday, they had a big election. And the Social Democrats won. uh, And how they won was they went with the far right. They were fine with the welfare. They pushed it. We're going to put more money in the welfare state. They, they, you know, the, we're going to combat climate change. But, oh, by the way, we're closing our borders. Big time. Huh? Oh, yeah. 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 Three, four, five years ago, when the explosion happened and the flood of people coming in from Syria and elsewhere took place, you saw a massive rise in Denmark in immigration And over the last several years, they've complained about it tremendously. The far right throughout Europe has had a very big populist movement that has taken hold in several countries. And it happened in Denmark. The left made a comeback by saying, no, we're still going to give you the, 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 the welfare state that you guys enjoy. We're still going to give you those things. We're going to take on climate change. We're going to do all of those things. But by the way, we're also going to make sure that we are able to do these things, and we're going to be able to do it the way that Denmark does it, by not allowing immigration the way that it's gone, by halting immigration, by making it tougher for immigration here. Oh, yeah. So while we're running towards, hey, maybe we shouldn't really do anything here with borders, they're running towards, maybe we should have borders 
that are strong. And maybe we should keep and defend the Danish way of life. Seriously, you can't talk socialism in America without going to the OG, Senator Bernie Sanders. I believe in a society where all people do well, not just a handful of billionaires. I know that capitalism has given us a bunch of really dope things, right? iPhones, cars, hamburgers, the Avengers movies, the opioid crisis. So why are young people like myself very open to socialism? Your generation, the younger generation, will in all likelihood have a lower standard of living your parents now is that true i don't know because i'll tell you why every time i hear him all i hear is how we're going to have the largest transfer of wealth in the coming years than we've ever had and a lot of that is going to be people like him their parents are going to be passing away and they're going to be left homes and money and retirement and things of that nature. well chad it's totally different you, you gotta understand so look look it is definitely tougher out there because these kids are coming out of school with massive amounts of debt we know that but a lower standard of living, that's another one of those things that gets sold to you all the time. It's a lower standard of living. It's a lower standard. Everything's a lower standard of living. Our poor, in many cases, have phones, have cable, have cars, have air conditioning and heating. A lower standard of living. Hello. Your generation is leaving school more deeply in debt, having a much harder time finding affordable housing. The jobs that you get will pay less. So the idea of creating a society with more egalitarianism, I think, is very appealing uh, to young people. If you go to countries like Denmark or Sweden, you're going to see very little poverty. You could leave your job. You could start a new business. You and your family still have health care as a right. So I could quit The Daily Show and be fine. Absolutely. Oh, well, there you go. And that's what people would do in a lot of ways. People are fine. It means if they, if they, if they ended up not working, they'd be okay. How pissed would you be if your neighbor didn't do anything and the government paid for them to do what they're doing now and you didn't get any further ahead than they did, even when you improved your life? That'd be frustrating. And again, we want to look at what Denmark has done. Denmark tells you all the time, we're a capitalist society. We just have a very big beneficial welfare state. We're now moving towards a tougher immigration policy, right? They have school choice. They're a society where essentially it is there is no diversity. Everybody's kind of on par with one another. So we're all rowing somewhat in the same direction, understanding. We, we, we always want to skip all of those things and just pick and choose the little things that we want to do. Right? They have no minimum wage, by the way, in Europe, in, in Denmark. There's no minimum wage there. Could we get away with that now? We're screaming about it. It's so funny because we'll go out and scream, we need a living wage, we need this, we need that and the other, and we need to be more like Denmark. Well, they've got school choice. Probably not going to happen here with the unions. They have a very generous welfare state, but they have very little diversity. They're very free market, in many cases, as free market as we are anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They have a much tougher immigration policy, and it's getting more and more tough. Uh, they don't have a minimum wage. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a little different. It is a little different. It's a lot different. My problem with somebody like Bernie Sanders is he wants the government to be the end-all to be-all. Where he'll say, no, there should be private ownership, but we need to regulate you so you get to the point where you may own and run the company, but you don't really run the company. You're taking all of the risk, and the reward is being slowly but surely taken away from you. That's something I don't want to be a part of. But I do have one real problem with socialism. I like money. You know, TV's going kind of good for me right now, and I'm thinking of writing a successful book. Is socialism still for me if I'm a millennial millionaire? I mean, it depends on what's your heart. If what you say in your life is all I want to do is make as much money as I possibly can and screw everything else, I don't give a damn. Yeah, no, I don't think democratic socialism is your cup of tea. But if you have a decent heart and you say, look, I'm doing really well, but you know what? I also want to be a contributor to the well-being of society. So I'm going to pay my fair share of taxes. Yeah, but even as your fair share, what's your fair share? That's the thing we always debate. What's your fair share? What's somebody's fair share of taxes? 50%, 60%, 100% after X amount of millions? What's somebody's fair share of taxes? I think that's a very fair question. And if... 
you want to have your trickle down economics by taking money from me and trickling it down to the poor because you feel you know what's better for it, saying that you're doing your part. I'm not a big fan of that. Again, I think there's ways that we can go about taxing people to take away a lot of the opportunities that are there for them to 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 use the system in place that's legal right now if we're serious about it. But I do want to know, hey, what's your fair share? What is I'm just curious about what that fair share is. 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Do you think Bernie would like a have it if we had no minimum wage? If we had school choice? If we tighten up the immigration policy? If we weren't as diverse? It works in a lot of these play. I watched soccer games this weekend. I watched Finland take on Bosnia Herzegovina. You know what I didn't see? Any diversity. We scream about how diversity is our great thing here, but all of these countries that they champion, they have very little diversity. Everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. There is no real drop-off from, quote-unquote, the top to the bottom in a lot of things. But we don't want to have those kind of conversations because it's not right. A lot of good things are happening, but I want to thank Mexico, and we do have one other thing that will be announced at the appropriate time, but they have to get approval from their legislative body. What is it? Why are the Mexicans <laughs> denying it then? I don't think they'll be denying it very long. It's all done. Why is it got to be a Mexican in your true story? Oh, <gasps> I don't know what it is. He got the tariff thing. Does it really matter? Because tariffs never went on. And there's a, something else is supposed to be dangling out there. New York Times reported this was done two months ago. But they also said some of the stuff that they are adding to it, like the potential for... Uh, amnesty to be essentially started and completed in Mexico before they ever get here, which I think would be huge if we could do that. I think that's a big player in this. But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And 90 days, by the way, for those of you not keeping score, 90 days is kind of the test run in this situation. So we're going to go 90 days, and if nothing changes dramatically we're probably going to be in the same situation uh, that we were last week, which is the threat of tariffs. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson shows your Twitter. There was a crash in New York. ABC News has learned that the pilot killed in this incident is Timothy McCormack. He holds a commercial helicopter pilot's license and was also a certified flight instructor. He was also the same pilot who was involved in a 2014 incident over New York City in which he had to make an emergency landing after an apparent bird strike. He told ABC affiliate WABC at the time that it was, quote, pretty much like an explosion going off in your cockpit. Uh, so I was telling producer Phil and Anthony this nonstop on CNN for hours. And it's a, it, Mayor Cuomo came out and said, something's fishy here. But other people have said, I don't I think this was just an accident. It was bad weather. You know, who knows? But it was nonstop. And I was like, if this was anywhere else, it would have been a blip on the screen. But, man, New York, talk about the center of something, right? Like, this is, this is huge. This is huge. Luckily, nobody else is killed. There's only one person uh, that died, and who knows why. They showed pictures earlier of what the the helicopter looked a bit out of control before it smashed into the building. A few other people were injured, but it was just, it was the coverage itself was, I was like amazed at that. I'm telling you guys, when Sully landed that plane on the Hudson, if it happens in California, in the Pacific Ocean, and he said as much, you're not getting this comparatively to to what happens if you land in the Hudson. 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's Chad Benson Show. Experiencing separation anxiety? <laughs> That's dumb. Check out Chad 24-7 at his website, chadbensonshow.com. And on iTunes, free. The Chad Benson Show. 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 Never feel lonely again. The Mueller report offers a very powerful legal analysis, that notwithstanding the fact that the pardon power is one of the most unrestricted presidential powers, it cannot be used for improper purposes. That is Mr. Dean. Who? Yeah, exactly. Mr. Mr. Dean. Who is he? What is he? Well, he's a former aide to Nixon. He went to jail in Watergate. And today, John Dean was up testifying 
For what? I don't know. They brought him up to testify. Yeah, the Democrats did. Well, I know why. Because they want to say, hey, let us show you the parallels between something and something. And that something was Nixon and Trump, Russiagate and... In many ways, the Mueller report is to President Trump what the so-called Watergate roadmap, officially titled the Grand Jury Report and Recommendation Concerning Transmission of Evidence to the House of Representatives, was to President Richard Nixon. Yeah. Jim Jordan asked him, hey, did you tweet this? And all of these things about how much he can't stand Donald Trump. And what kind of names they should give Donald Trump and all of these things. And I just laughed because there was no reason for this. There wasn't. I I told producer Phil just a little while ago, we could literally bring in this guy. We started making Jimmy Dean sausage in 1969. So you could bring in Jimmy Dean, who will have as much to say about this that matters as John. Well, John Dean's been there. He's been through the whole thing. He may have been through the whole thing. But there is no reason for him to be there. You don't like Trump, so they bring you up. They talk about the parallels between you two, but we're still talking apples and oranges. And you talk to several people in the Democratic Party. You even tweeted out about how much you can't stand him, how you talk to Nancy Pelosi about impeachment, and yada, yada, yada. Again, you know, why not have the McCarthy hearings all over again? Why not? Just for the hell of it. That's what they're doing with our money, people. That's what they're doing with our money. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from you. The measles, baby. The measles. There are now more than a 1,000 confirmed cases of measles, the CDC says, 1,022 to be exact. And the outbreak has now spread to more than half the states, 28 states total, with Idaho, New Mexico, Virginia, and Maine getting their first cases. The highly contagious disease had been wiped out in the U.S., but is surging back, health officials say, because of parents refusing to vaccinate their kids. This outbreak is now the worst since 1992, when more than 2,000 cases were recorded in the U.S. Now we got the whooping call. Man, there's stuff coming back back big time i can't wait for scarlet fever what else do we got what else can we bring we we get we have retro rage what can we bring back disease wise that you're like oh wow that look, yeah look at you look at you doing that three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at chad benson show is your twitter right bubonic plague let's make a little bit of a comeback right we got what else what else is re- german measles that could make a comeback too something else got to find some other things something old timey so Uriah Faber, big-time MMA guy, has challenged now, I guess, Bieber to a fight, who challenged Tom Cruise to a fight. This could be pretty amazing. This could be amazing. Would you pay to see Cruise fight Bieber? Scientology versus Christianity. Pop star versus pop icon. Dana White could sell the hell out of that. It'd be interesting. Would you pay to see Jack Reacher take on the Bieber. Mm. Yeah, that'd be interesting. 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson shows your Twitter. Would you pay to see Jesus take on L. Ron Hubbard? <laughs> I'd pay for that. My money's on the man, the myth, the Jesus. I'm just saying. Opioids, bad, indeed. Lawsuits everywhere. A man who's in the Lawyer Hall of Fame, who has sued Big Tobacco, the auto industry, and it's now taking on the opioid big pharma world. He'll join us straight ahead. Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. 
It is a crisis that is going on. We talk about all the other crises and emergencies in the country. This one is real. Joining us now is a man who's in the uh, with the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. There's only about 25 of them. He's an author, uh, and he's got a new book out, Law and Addiction. Joining us now is uh, Mike Papantonio. And the opioid crisis is real. Uh, Mike, you have been dealing with it. You have uh, uh, been dealing with it head on. You've gone after big tobacco, the automobile industries, and now you're going after uh, the, the, the big pharma industry. And it's a very interesting battle that's going on right now with Big Pharma, as you see around the country, because of how many people are dying and the addiction and the devastation that this drug is causing nationwide. Yeah, I think probably the ugliest part about this chat is by the time we uh, finish this interview, they'll, well, 150 people will die today because of what the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry did. And they knew what they were doing. I think that's the ugliest part of the story. You know, I've handled, we, as you pointed out, our law firm launched the case uh, against Big Tobacco. And that was ugly. I mean, that was an ugly, ugly case. The documents were extraordinarily bad. But, you know, there people had 35 years to die. Here they die. uh, A child goes in with a broken ankle. He's given 50 Oxycontin. In seven days, he's hooked, goes through the other 50, becomes an addict. Before you know it, he's dying of an overdose from heroin. And that's that's not that's that there, there's nothing that was secret about that. There was nothing that was not easily understood about that. The the industry knew right off the bat what the potential problem was. So, um, you know, you do a lot of things. For, you, you do a lot of things for money. But when it comes to killing 150 people a day, that's pretty ugly. You know, you look at, the, and again, the crisis is massive and it's growing and it's growing exponentially comparatively over the last decade or so when you look at the amount of people who are dying from this. But, you know, one of the things is that this does have benefits that things like big tobacco, that tobacco doesn't have, but it's it once again goes back to overuse, overprescribed. And how do we walk that fine line in a world where this does provide relief for some people, unfortunately also provides addiction for others? Well, here's the problem. What the, the line you just used, Chad, is a line that the industry has launched to try to make it look like, gee, they're on the right side of this, which is some people need this. Well, that's true. Some people need this product. And as a matter of fact, when it came onto the market, it had the specific need that it was approved for. And that is breakthrough pain and end of life. All right. But that wasn't enough money. It was, cancer wasn't a big enough thing for this industry. So they said, how can we be really ghoulish? I mean, how can we really dig way down and be the biggest ghoul we can? And that is, let's tell doctors that it can be used for everything. And then they went out, Chad, and then they hired all these biostitutes. And biostitute is simply some cat who works for a university. He's, uh, you know, making $150,000 a year. The industry comes on, hey, doc, how about this? What if we write some literature and you sign off on it saying that our opioid is different, that it's not a regular narcotic, that it's somehow different from all the opium that's been killing people for thousands of years? You know, it, all it is is opium, Chad. I mean, you can call it what you want, dress it up, Oxycontin, call it whatever you want. It's opium. And the history of opium goes 2,000 years back to China, where it almost decimated the entire continent. And so this, all, all these folks did is they figured out how can we, how can we create this, this, this lie? How do we create a lie where doctors believe us and we actually start selling this stuff? If, if you look at the history on this, which we have, I mean, I'm taking, you know, I'm in the middle of discovery on this case. The book, Law and Addiction, that you opened up with, that book tells the story of how this whole litigation started. And it started with a small town in uh, West Virginia where there were 400 people living in that town. And they, the industry was putting 6 million pills into that town every year. Now, do the math. I mean, 400 people can't absorb 6 million pills. So what did the company understood, understand? They understood that all those other pills, they were moving into what we call criminal diversion. They were moving into pill mills. They were moving into street drugs. The industry clearly understood what was happening. They had the numbers. They kept up with the numbers. So let's assume the first year, they, the first year they said, oh, gee, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we, we're honorable people. The se- give them the first year. Give them the second year. We didn't know what was going to happen. 
By the third year, the profits were off the chart, and the lie kept being perpetuated. So I have no sympathy for this argument. People are always going to be able to get this product, uh, Chad. They're always going to be able to get it if it's, if it's real. But the industry has that line that you just used. They created that line, Chad. And so now that's yeah. their big defense. Well, that's the fence they're going to run with. And uh, so you, the, all across the country, we're talking to Mike uh, Papantino, who is uh, a lawyer. He's in the, the Lawyer Hall of Fame, which I didn't even know we had a Lawyer Hall of Fame. We have a Hall of Fame for everything. And he's one of the only 25 yeah. living lawyers in the Lawyer Hall of Fame. You've taken on Big Tobacco. You've taken the automobile industry. You've looked at them. You've taken them on. What, when you look at tobacco and you look at, the, uh, for instance, uh, the automobile industry and the pharmaceutical industry, what do they have in common? Is it is is it is it greed? Is it lies to well, to cover their ass? What what exactly is it that they all have in common? Here's what they have in common. First of all, we want to say a corporation is a person, right? That's the new talking point. Gee, we're a corporation, we're a person. You need to treat us like a person. A person gets thrown in jail when they do something wrong. That's what we do with a person. But what they what they want is two protections. They want to say, well, where it comes to financial issues, we're you know we're a corporation and we're not a person. Where it comes to the punishment that flows from those financial decisions that are all bad, well, we don't want to be punished for that. Here's the difference. Right now, there is no difference in um, you, you have to you have to start from this position. Capitalism works. Capitalism is honestly one of the best systems in the world. It works. And you're talking to somebody who's always on the other side of big corporations, whether it's tobacco, auto, pharmaceutical. I'm always on the other side of it. It's not all of industry that operates the same way. Just like any other thing, you've got the people that make, mis they make mistakes, and then you have people who intentionally carry out conduct that is reprehensible. So yeah. what is, what's ended up happening in the last, I'd say, 20 years, Chad? Kids are coming out of MBA school, all right? They're moving in. They, 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 here's their goal. I want to be a CEO of a corporation for three years. I want to maximize the profits of that corporation for three years. When I leave the corporation, I want to have big money in my pocket for what I've done. I want to move on. I want to make these big, big checks. That's the mentality of the new corporate America. Hasn't always been like that. Used to be a corpor uh, corporate CEO was with a company 20 years. They weren't, just, they weren't making big profits and then putting big risks out there and then moving on. This is the equivalent. This is the this is the equivalent. What what this what the drug industry has done is the equivalent of somebody coming to your town and polluting a river that maybe runs through your town with a deadly toxin, and then they say, "Well, we're putting this deadly toxin in your river because we make big profits because we don't have to worry about the real cleanup." They pass that on. It's they pass it on to the taxpayers to clean it up, right? The taxpayers have to deal with the deadly toxin. That's what the industry wants to happen with this epidemic. We now have this deadly toxin we've put out there. It's invited other deadly toxins like heroin and fentanyl. We created the atmosphere for that. Now we want taxpayers to pay for the rehab. We want taxpayers to pay for the EMTs that are so stressed they can barely stay alive because there's so many overdoses. We want taxpayers to pay for the, the uh, hospitalization and the police forces that are now required. We want taxpayers to do that. And you know what? We want to keep all the profits. That's what yeah. the industry has done to America. You should have zero sympathy, zero sympathy for these folks who've made this decision. And I, I, I'm always amazed that some of these talking points that they put out there, people actually buy into, like it was the doctor's fault. No, it wasn't the doctor's fault. They created literature that lied to the doctors. They made up, phonied up literature. They phonied up clinical data that doctors relied on. So it's not a doctor issue. You got, you've got doctors had pill mills. Yeah, they were criminals. The pill mills were criminals. But the average doctor do doesn't know this backstory on this. The American public doesn't know. The media doesn't even tell the story.
Talking to Mike uh, Papantonio, author and uh, lawyer. Uh, you know, one of the things, though, is you talk about big pharma and the battle of big pharma has been around forever. You know, and as we all know, in, in in every single year, there's somebody new to take on. And this is the this is the the people right now that are facing. Uh, uh, well, they're in the crosshairs of everything from politicians to lawyers like yourself. But, you know, what? one of the things that I want to address is the fact that I think in a lot of ways, the lobbying they've done and the crony capitalism that they've played this game with on both sides of the aisle is something that also doesn't get brought up, and that drives me crazy as much as everything else does in this situation. Well, how about this? Let me run this by you. How does the Attorney General of the United States, when he's approached by the DEA, and, is in, and he's told, look, Mr. Attorney General, we need to criminally prosecute some of these people. We need to have, we need to have fines that are in excess of a billion dollars. This is a story that was run by the Washington Post. It was a brilliant story, brilliant investigative journalism, maybe some of the best investigative journalism I've seen. And then the attorney general says, eh, nah, I'm going to pass on it. You know why? Because they don't look like, I mean, they, they look different. They appear in three-piece suits. They have, you know, Rolex watches. They drive Bentleys. So we treat them differently. For some reason, they don't look like they would do these bad things, so we treat them differently. They appear in front of Congress. They commit perjury right in front of Congress, and we treat them differently. It's like the time, I don't know if you remember the scene of the 12 dwarfs standing up in front of Congress, all of the CEOs of the big tobacco company, and honestly, I, you know, I was watching it, couldn't believe it, for two hours, lie after lie after lie, and then nobody's prosecuted. How do you change yeah. culture? What do you do to change culture if that's the, if that's the setting? Well, I think the thing that we're doing right now, talking about and discussing and getting everything out there and letting everybody, you know, the problem is, is like, you know, everything, you know, Mike, when you put this stuff out there, it's what will people believe and who, who, and, and you know, it's better than who has a better sales job when it comes to the narrative, when it comes to something like this. And this sales job is just getting started. The battle is uh, just getting started. The opioid crisis is, uh, uh, is real and it's, uh, it, it's, it's damaging our country in a lot of ways. Appreciate you coming on today, Micah Papantonio. Uh, I appreciate this big time. A law and addiction is the name of your new book. And, uh, thanks so much for taking time with us today and good luck on all your trials. Thanks for the invite, Chad. Thanks. At Chad Benson Show, Twitter, C-H-A-D-B-E-N-S-O-N. This is something that's just getting going. Again, it's about who can sell the narrative to the American people better than the other side. That's just it. Can you find a sympathetic jury? How do you go about doing these things, whether it's Monsanto, right, and Roundup Cleaner, or I saw one the other day for Johnson & Johnson baby powder. I mean, it is uh, this, though, the big pharma, they're, they right now are facing it big time, and they're going to be settling left, right, and center and fighting some and settling others. It's the Chad Benson Show. Set Chad straight. Text the show, 323-538-2423. That's 323-538-CHAD. Someone has to do it. Might as well be you. The Chad Benson Show. Tens of pages long. This is the phone bill Nadine Spear received. The Canadian businesswoman was asked to pay 61,000 Canadian dollars, more than 40,000 euros, for calls she claimed she didn't make. Like that's my annual salary. That's my, I would have to mortgage my house to pay it. Like I'm, I'm really trying hard to stay calm about this because I can't believe that there isn't another solution and that I'm, as a consumer, I'm so vulnerable that I could just get a bill and, and everybody gets to go, sorry. Sorry, eh? Yeah. How about that? You get a bill for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. You go to your phone company. You're like, hey, phone company, take a look at my last several bills. Have you noticed anything? Yeah, I've never made calls to these places, and now my bill's forty grand, and you want me to pay for it because you're pretty sure it's me in now. Her phone company, Bell MTS, insists you must pay the bill for the calls, mostly made to Cuba and the Philippines. Obviously, it's illogical. It's not, I don't even think, like, a, a reasonable person couldn't look at this and, and think that a person's actually sitting making phone calls. Experts say it could be the work of professional hackers. Yeah, you think? Professional hackers? God, that's got to suck. 
been there as far as had really expensive calls. Do any of you out there, now kids, you wouldn't understand this, but do any of you out there remember back in the day when you used to go over your data plan? You're like, oh my God, and your numbers, you would be like, oh, dude, I can't. It's, I'm over my data plan. I'm over my minutes, right? Or like back in the 80s and even 90s when people used to have regular phones before everybody went mobile. And you would maybe talk to somebody who was far away. You either have a calling card or something like that. And, yeah, remember that? And maybe you'd go over it and it cost too much. Oh, whew. Jim and Cricket. Remember how expensive collect calls were? <laughs> Those things were so expensive as well. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from the United States Women National Team. Kicks off their World Cup adventure tomorrow. Right now, it's it's group stage for us. It's one game. It's Thailand, and that's everything is is sort of here, laser focus. Um, but certainly, as a fan of, of football, to see you know the crowd, the excitement, just the overall atmosphere. I mean, that's you couldn't ask for anything in terms of just how it comes across because you want this great game to just take off everywhere. And I think uh, it was a, it was a great showcase game for that. That's Jill Ellis. She coaches the team. And Hope Solo, who's had more than a few issues with not only U.S. soccer, but also a few issues with the front end, some, some loss and some naked pictures, uh, is no longer with the team, uh, came out and said, uh, essentially, that the, our, the, our coach cracks under pressure and uh, to watch out for that. Tomorrow we play Thailand. Now, here's me being a jerk. Women's sports, in particular team sports, usually has a situation where there are four or five, six good teams, if that, and then everybody else. I don't know what the score will be tomorrow, but uh, I would guess that we'll put at least six to eight by Thailand. I don't know how good they are, but I don't expect them to put up much of a battle. We're the best team in the world. And uh, for, and here's the beauty of America. And, and, and you know, for all the craziness that we talk about it, one thing we've done over the years is we've encouraged girls to get involved in sports and do stuff. We've had Title IX, which is that's what it was originally in many ways about. And that's great. That's why we, for years, were the most dominant in all sports because we really encouraged girls to play sports. Some of the world's catching up. Tomorrow will not be one of those days. Tomorrow will be one of those days. If you want to see America and you like goals, and I think the game's at 11 a.m. Uh, uh, Pacific time, uh, 2, 2 p.m. Eastern, if you want to see a ton of goals. Let's just put it this way. If you've never played sports before and you've never, ever kicked a soccer ball, you can play goalie tomorrow for the U.S. Women's National Team. You do not have to worry about them scoring. I just want to push that out there. Not trying to be mean to Thailand. I'm just letting you guys know. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Who would you take? Would you take Bieber? Would you take Cruz? What is there, got a 30-year difference in age? Who do you have? Would you take Jack Reacher over the Beebs? Uriah Faber, he says, look, I, I would like to take the Beebs, but the reality is Tom Cruise has some sneaky ninja moves. Is that a possibility? Who knows? He is Jack Reacher, you know. It's the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is something the U.S. has been trying to get for over 20 years with Mexico. They've never been able to do it. As soon as I put tariffs on the table, it was it was done. It took two days. Two days. That is dos days. Two. Two days. But that's not true, Chad, because the New York Times reported that it took it was done two, three months ago. Well, nothing was on paper. It is on paper now. And here's the other thing. Right. And I want everybody to understand this. I'm not a huge fan of what he was trying to do. Uh, did it work out this time? Well, time will tell. Like everything, time will tell. But 
one thing that wasn't in the original agreement that is now in this agreement, I guess, is the fact that, well, you know what, we'll let her explain it. The United States will immediately expand the implementation of the existing migrant protection protocols across its entire southern border. This means that the, those crossing the U.S. southern border to seek asylum will be rapidly returned to Mexico where they may await the adjudication of their asylum claims. That's important because if you ask any of the people, having been on the border from McAllen, right, to, to, to Tucson, to Yuma, and in, in California, down at the southern border there, having been to all of them, you ask any one of the Border Patrol agents, and one of the things they think, and, they, and they're, they're pretty much all to, to a man and woman, have said, fix the asylum laws, and this fixes a lot of this. The asylum laws now are, you come here, you apply for asylum, you stay here. But that's if you're coming from Central America. Other countries, let's say you were to fly from some other country and you land in Canada and you try to apply to asylum here. They'll tell you, nope, can't do it. Got to do it to the first place where there is safety, which would be Canada, and you apply for asylum there. So... Mexico is saying, all right, fine, we'll get on board with that. In response, Mexico will authorize the entrance of all of those individuals for humanitarian reasons in compliance with its international obligations while they await the adjudication of their asylum claims. So essentially what that means is if they're coming here, they want to apply for asylum, they don't do it at our ports of entry, they've got to do it first in Mexico, they've got to wait until we give them a yay or nay. And Mexico is going to allow them to apply for asylum there. I think this could be big. I think it could work out. But like everything else, we'll see. Proof's in the pudding, and this is going to take time to figure out. We have a real issue at the border. A massive issue at the border. On a daily basis, the amount of people that are coming over here. 144,000 last month apprehended. Three months in a row, over 100,000 people apprehended at the border. Those are people who are giving themselves in. Apprehended is a, they're, they're, we're not catching them. They're just walking up and surrendering. Think about the people that get through that we don't know about, and then think about the visas as well. So we need to look across everything, not just the border. We have an issue, and it needs to be dealt with. 323-538-2423, at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler says criminal contempt moves against Attorney General William Barr have been postponed after the Justice Department agreed to turn over key underlying evidence from the Mueller report. However, the full House is still expected to vote on a resolution which would clear the way for the Judiciary panel to go to court to seek civil enforcement of the subpoenas for Barr and former White House Counsel Don McGahn. The DOJ documents pertain to possible obstruction of justice by President Trump. So we'll find out, right? Like, this is yet another step. And today they're going to be interviewing, uh, apparently, <laughs> like, somebody who's involved with, with, with Watergate. I, I, at this point in time, I just, you sit back and you're like, you guys do whatever that you need to do. Just tell me when it's over. I'm just going to go and start looking at 2020, and we'll go from there. All right? You guys do whatever it is you need to do. I'm going, I'm of the opinion that this is going to play itself out at the ballot box that's that's what I think is going to happen. That's what I think is going to happen. And oddly enough, this weekend, Democrats converged on Ohio, Iowa because it's a very important thing. And we're getting some new numbers. One of the numbers I found to be interesting is the fact that while Biden's coming down a little bit and others are gaining over 65, Biden dominates. And remember, those are voters, voters who show up and are consistent And that's something that people need to pay attention to. It's not what your number is with the young, because as we all know, the young don't show up the way that they say they're going to show up. And they haven't shown that. And until they show that, you've got to look around and go, well, he's still got some things going on. But there is some slippage. That is a little bit of a warning sign for Joe Biden. On the other hand, he's got the widest support across the party of any of the candidates. He's in some ways for a lot of Democrats the safe choice. The candidate who's best positioned to beat uh, President Trump, not necessarily the choice of those who are looking to really back a candidate with some passion. But he has slipped a bit since the last poll. The other big news there is that uh, Bernie Sanders has slipped a bit since the last poll and pretty big surge for Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And uh, Elizabeth Warren's doing pretty well as well. Yeah, Elizabeth Warren is definitely making some moves. 
And the Bernie Sanders thing is, is he's have his thunder stolen because there's so many other people in his lane that are younger, that they're they're doing the things that he was doing when he was alone and he had an audience that was all his that he could command. Now other people are looking around going, he's saying the same thing and I like him because he's a little bit younger or I like him or I like her because of this. So they're able to move over to there where he had that all to himself. The only other person that was kind of like him during the last election period, even though she wasn't in it, was Elizabeth Warren. And Elizabeth Warren, I think, is doing well because she's coming out and she's saying, all right, this is what I want to do. Here is my plan to do it. It's not just words. I have plans to do it. And this is what I want to do. So we'll see. There's a ton of people, though, man. I got it. I, I, we're, what, we're two weeks away from the first of the Democratic debates. And so many of them have absolutely no numbers, like not even close to having numbers at all. And you've got the likes of Beto. I don't know that, that this many months out from the caucuses in Iowa, that these polls really indicate what our prospects are. Uh, if, if I relied on polls in any race that I'd run, I never would have been able to serve in the United States Congress. We never would have tried to take on Ted Cruz, and we wouldn't have been able to lead the largest grassroots effort in, in the history of the state of Texas. Yeah. Well, polls right now show that you're getting your ass kicked. That's what the polls show. You're getting thumped. Mayor Pete, on the other hand, is surging. People like him. And I think the way he is, is his naturalness, and the way he goes about things, and the way that he delivers is vitally important. Because likability is still really important. We're a cult of personality nation, and he's got a bit of a cult of personality, and it is rising every time he has a chance to have a high uh, position and a platform to speak. He, he knocks it out the park. And this season in the life of America's political development is one to end the idea that American values are property of conservatives and Republicans, starting with freedom. Freedom is not a conservative value, it is an American value. And while our Republican friends like to talk about freedom like it's theirs alone, we know that freedom includes economic freedom and you're not free if you don't have a living wage in this country. They all say the same thing, though. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? You, you could pick, they all, nobody's saying anything different from one another. And one of the reasons Trump stood out, and this is what people are missing on the left side of the aisle, one of the reasons Trump stood out from everybody else is because he said the things that some people were maybe thinking but were afraid to say, and he said the things that people were never thinking and would never say. And that stood out to them. In a very, 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 very big way. In fact, uh, uh, Charles Blow, who is a New York Times columnist, was on with Bill Maher uh, over the weekend. And it was very interesting what he said. And this is very much a very true statement about Trump and his base. We center the, his support, his base, to a degree that is not healthy for the rest of us who are saying and looking at this through yeah. the normal prism of morality and character, because they are not. They treat Donald Trump as folk hero. The folk hero does not have to play by the same rules of morality that the rest of us do. Yeah, folk hero. Not that they're insane, but folk hero. Because I think a lot of that's true. When I talk to people who are big supporters of Trump, they love who he is, and how he stands up to them. They don't care about all the rest of the stuff. They don't. They w not my house, right? Wouldn't be my thing. But I don't have to live with him. I don't have to be married to him. Whatever, blah, 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 blah. And they're able to compartmentalize things like that. But, I mean, if, if, we, were, if we were able to... Look, the reality is that there's a lot of people that you're around on a day-to-day -day basis that you wouldn't want to live like, and you don't really, really think they're good people, but you have to work with them. You have to do things because that's part of what your life is. We get that, right? I understand that. A lot of other people don't understand that, but I get that. But Trump has given people in his base a voice they felt they didn't have. 
The folk hero is allowed to do things that you wouldn't allow in your own home. They know he's lying, but they don't allow their sons and daughters to lie to them, and they don't go to work and lie to their bosses. But because he has transcended in their minds to that level, the only sin that the folk hero can, can commit is to, is to betray the folk. Yeah, and he's not done that. Saw a new poll today that even in the battleground states, like Pennsylvania and stuff, there he's still holding strong. And as long as the economy stays the way it is, we're going to be in a position that in 2020, if it stays the way it is, I just don't see anybody beating him. That could change. A lot can change, as we all know. But at this moment in time, I don't. And he is a folk hero for a lot of people. And they're willing to overlook some of the stuff. And the thing is, what politician doesn't lie? And what is that lie? That's the question I always ask. What's the lie? Because every politician I've ever seen, if his mouth is moving, would always say, what? He's lying. That's been around long before Trump. And I've heard whoppers from a lot of them that promised me things and what they were going to do, knowing full well that none of that was going to come true. But how much do we call them on it? 323-538-2423 323-538-2423 at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Hey, whether you're right or left, it doesn't matter when it comes to this organization. It's called Wounded Paul. It's an amazing organization put together by people who, because of their relationships with animals, when they were struggling coming back from war, helped them get over the hump in times of struggle. Now they put together an organization called Wounded Paw that finds dogs who are going to be euthanized and then gets them to the people that they know they're going to help because they train them as service dogs. That's our veterans, our first responders, and their families. It is amazing. So you're saving a paw and you're saving a life. 20 veterans a day die because of suicide, and they're looking for help right now. That's what they're looking for. RVs, trucks, cars, even a boat. You're going to get a tax-deductible gift. And you're going to go save a life and save a paw. It's that amazing. They also take cash. You can go to woundedpaw.org. That's woundedpaw.org. Or you can call 844-678-4PAW. That's 844-678-4729. You're going to be saving a life as well as a paw. Woundedpaw.org. It's the Chad Benson Show. Feel free to punk this punk rocker any time of the day or night. Reach Chad on Twitter at Chad Benson Show and on Instagram at Chad Benson Show. And oh yeah, the Chad Benson Show on Facebook too. Punk that. There are still 24 cases that were argued this year that have yet to be decided. They include contentious issues of political gerrymandering, whether a 2020 census can include the citizenship question. Also the case out of Maryland in that World War I memorial in the shape of a cross. Can it stand on public land? All of those cases will be saved for the very end. The next two weeks, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg over the weekend suggested these cases will be divisive. Yes, they will be. And that's why the courts continue to be so vitally important because of how Trump has placed the court to the right. Now, you still have a couple wild cards in there. Kavanaugh has gone against the right on a few occasions, with I think surprise. Even Ginsburg gave him some credit. You don't know what Chief Justice Roberts is going to do, but by and large, it's now five to four if you're looking at who appointed them. It's now five to four. So once again, showing you how important it is and the legacy that a president can lead, leave behind that will benefit the future if you're on one side or the other. Three, two, three, five, three, eight, twenty four, twenty three at Chad Benson show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. Ah, Poppy. Somebody shot Big Poppy. You don't know who he is. He's a beloved figure. David Ortiz from the Dominican Republic. They call him Big Poppy in Boston, and somebody shot him. Somebody wandered in and shot him at a nightclub when he was just minding his own. Witnesses say the gunman jumped off a motorcycle, walked into the Dominican Republic nightclub, and shot Ortiz at point-blank range in the back. The bullet exited through his stomach. Surveillance video shows people in the club scattering for safety. Police say the gunman was captured and beaten by an angry crowd. Before going into surgery, a local reporter says Ortiz told emergency room doctors, quote, please don't let me die. 
I'm a good man. Yeah, he got whooped up on. Uh, but he seems to be doing much better. But this is a guy, he, he in the Dominican, he is like... Baseball is such a part of life in the Dominican Republic, and it is, you know, we look at our athletes and, you know, we, it, you, you, you've had some few in the past that are like the Michael Jordans of the world and, and, and whatnot, and that we hold to this esteemed Tom Brady's and some of that stuff like that. But we can also be a bit divided because they're, you know, hey, you're from here and you're from here, and I think this guy's the best. Over there in the Dominican, baseball stars, they are, they are living gods because of how big the sport is in that country. I don't know what happened here. David Ortiz is an idol in the Dominican Republic. He is, you know, considered one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But not only that, the work that he has done for the people of the Dominican Republic, specifically with children, his foundation has helped a lot of children in the Dominican Republic. And he is just a beloved, like a larger than life sports figure. You know how beloved he is in Boston. Just imagine that for an entire country. Yeah. So again, he's just hanging out in there somebody goes into the club and shoots him he lost his gallbladder just a silly thing to have anyways no he lost part of his uh, liter uh, liver and intestine uh and he is in intensive care but he is making a recovery and it's just a weird thing you know some of these countries where you go and you're a you you leave there you become a big star you have a lot of money you return home you help people but you're also a target and you see it with soccer players and people around the globe where their family members are kidnapped and stuff like this. But this guy rode in on a motorcycle, shot him, and then he had his ass whooped, and he's in custody right now. It's a weird story. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. It's the Chad Benson Show. Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. First off is you have to look at what the critics are saying. They're saying that this deal was struck uh, a month ago or two months ago, but the fact remains Mexico did nothing. It wasn't in writing. Nothing was happening. So President Trump had to um, threaten tariffs to force Mexico to actually step up and publicly agree to this deal. And now we can actually see Mexico doing its part to secure their southern border and allow us to send people back to Mexico pending their asylum claim. Which is huge. That's Brandon Judd right there who represents the uh, uh, Border Patrol. And that's a big thing right there. Sending people home while the asylum process is going on. Well, that's not fair. That's how the law was written. Yeah, I get it. It isn't. And we should fix that law. Because the, the way the law is written right now is they take advantage of that law. And that's something we can't have either. This is where common sense should come in. And say, all right, let's look at this in a real way. Now, did the tariffs and the fear of tariffs have something a part to play in this? You could argue yes and no, because you read the New York Times and they tell you how this deal was done months ago. But then you hear also in the New York Times, it says, but this was the new wrinkle that was thrown in. Oh, yeah. So it is interesting when you look at this and say, all right, did it have a, a real effect? On Mexico and having that opportunity now to send people back to Mexico or they or not even allow them to come here, make the process happen as far as asylum from there is big. And that 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 has an opportunity of really doing something when it comes to the amount of people that are here through the south of the border who are coming here and turning themselves in, being apprehended, if you will, at the border and slowing that down to something that's manageable. But I don't know what's going to happen from there. Again, all the things that we do, all the things that we try, none of it works if we don't enforce the laws. So now, instead of apprehending 144,000, they're going to try to go through places like California where they know they can get in 
and nobody's going to ask any questions, and they'll be shielded there, as opposed to going to Yuma or Tucson or McAllen. They may make another trek to Southern California to try to get in there. We need comprehensive reform across the board. That does not just include south of the border. That is all of our immigration system, and we need to figure out how we do this in a way that's real and manageable that can show, hey, look, we want people from other countries to come here. Absolutely, we need to be open to that because we need that. We need workers. And at the same time, not allow our laws to be used against us because that's not a winning recipe. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Sundar uh, Pichaya is the CEO of Google. And, of course, Google and, you know, you got the YouTube debate. You've got Twitter. You've got Facebook. Big tech's coming under so much scrutiny from the government, from all kinds of people. People are asking questions. What's going on? And last week, Google said, hey, YouTube's like, well, here's the deal. We're just going to get rid of all of these things that we deem to be hate speech. And now they're coming out talking about this uh, in an open way. And I don't know if this helps them. What goes through your mind when you watch a video like the recent one? You had this teenager who had appeared to be donning Muslim garb, spewing a lot of anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, homophobic hate. What goes through your mind when you see a video like that and see that it's gotten 350,000 views? You know, uh, I don't know all the details of this specific video, but uh, in general, look, I mean, all of us, uh, you know, none of us want harmful content on our platforms i think last quarter alone we removed nine million videos from the platform nine million videos from the platform nine million videos from the plat now how many of those people were also deplatformed, which is vitally important because that's also part of it right like because originally like with with crowder and some of the other ones who people are screaming oh they're horrible they're racist there's this and the other you're, you're pulling some of the videos off you're 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 not deplatforming them, but you're demonetizing them. So you're not making your money off them. They're not making you money, but you're allowing them to be there. It, it's it's again, it's one of those things where I'm still not quite sure, and I don't think they're sure either. But this I found to be interesting. You know, we had ranked content based on quality, so we're bringing that same notion and approach to YouTube, so that we can rank higher quality stuff better and really prevent borderline content content which doesn't exactly violate policies which need to be removed but which can still cause harm so i i'm not so wait you so stuff that doesn't break the rules you still want to get rid of because they maybe can cause harm and i think that's the thing they're talking about with like the flat earthers and i don't i still don't get what the flat earth conspiracy who that hurts right I mean, you know, what's next? Ghosts and aliens? Are we going to take those off, too? Because we're not quite sure we can and can't prove whether or not people have come here or beings have come here from another place or that your your spirit stays around here and could haunt you. I mean, I, I, I don't get that. I don't get that. I mean, what sort of grade would you give YouTube for where it's at right now? We aren't quite where we want to be, but I, I think it's a genuinely hard problem of how do you YouTube as the scale of the entire Internet? And I think we are making a lot of progress. But the thing we are trying to do is to bring more authoritative uh, sources and fact checks on videos which may be controversial. It's just, we need better frameworks around what is hate speech, what's not, and how do we as a company make those decisions at scale and get it right without making mistakes. Now, here's a problem with the fact checking side of things. In a world of virtue signaling, in the world of social justice warriors, in a world where facts no longer matter, feelings override that. What if your facts happen to be true, but people's feelings get hurt because the things that you're talking about is based in fact and because you don't like that fact. And enough people, you know, virtue signal and raise a stink. Do you get rid of that? Do you go against facts? if it doesn't fit the narrative that you want it to fit. And I think that's what a lot of people are saying out there. Well, wait a minute here. Even if I come up with facts, you don't like the facts. It doesn't fit your narrative. Then you want to get rid of it. And to me, I, I think that's not good, right? I don't think that's good at all. And I think as us being grown-ass adults, we should be able to make up our own minds in situations. Right. Let the marketplace. If somebody's advocating violence against another group or another person, that is one thing. 
if you don't like the fact that they're talking about it being flat earth versus the globe as we know it and this spherical thing that is rocketing around in space, well, you know, I mean, can I not make up my own mind? Like, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to change somebody's mind? It's like, hey, Jim, I just want to tell you, I used to think the earth was round, but I saw this video on YouTube now, and I think it's flat. I'm like, oh, my God. Well, I just, I don't know what that harms. I don't. And the problem is, is you don't get it all. So, and the picking and choosing frustrates the hell out of people. And the changing of your rules and or not following your rules also frustrates people and if you're saying things that are borderline you may still want to get rid of because it hurts i don't i don't get that i mean why have a rule then it's like saying i hit a home run it went over the wall yeah but it just barely went over the wall so we're just going to count it as a double huh that's not the rule well, that's the kind of the rule we're going with. okay Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Do love hearing from everybody. There's a crash today in New York City uh, with a helicopter, and I play guy. I play soccer with a guy who tells me he he's a helicopter pilot, and he's training right now to be a commercial airline pilot. He's been a helicopter pilot for a long time. He's forty years old. He always laughs. He always tells me it's not if, but when the helicopter is going to go down. I'm currently at 51st Street and 7th Avenue. Caution tape is up. People are uh, stopping and watching as police are just trying to get the area secure right now. Here's the thing about this. If this happens anywhere else in the country, nobody pays attention to it. But because it happens in New York City and there is it's the, it's the hub of America as far as news and the media goes, it, it'll be just followed all day long. It'll be followed all. If Sully Sullenberg, and he said this, if he had landed that plane in, you know, in in the Pacific Ocean, as opposed to the Hudson, probably not paying attention, like like it was. Probably not. Three two three five three eight twenty four twenty three at Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You can tweet at us. Love hearing from every single one of you. So this is interesting. So the battle for choice is still going on. And this is a big battle that is going to be out there for a very long time as we move towards 2020. It is going to be a very big deal on how you position yourself. And I'm a states' rights guy. I've continued to say that over and over again. I don't think, and, and we talked about it last week. Even if Roe v. Wade went away today, states will be allowed to make up their own mind when it comes to that. And that's what they're trying to do now without getting rid of Roe v. Wade put restrictions on things, some of which I think are over the top and ridiculous. And we've talked about that. But this will be a very big issue in 2020. And it is showing for if you look and see what is energizing the base on the left, gun control is one, climate change and choice. The GOP has sacrificed its ability to claim to be the party of freedom, especially when we see an attack on women's reproductive freedom that all of us, especially men, ought to be standing up to defend. So that's going to be big. It is going to be big. And this is where the battle comes right here. When you get somebody who's a big feminist, comes out, her name is Sophie Lewis, and she says something like this, and she was just being very matter of fact about it. This is when the people on the right scream, okay, this is ridiculous. I even had a friend who's on the left say, yeah, this is where I have a trouble with this kind of language that makes the people who are choice look like they're lunatics. The strategies be able to defend. Um, abortion is, in my opinion, um, and I recognize how controversial this is, um, a form of killing. It is a, a form of um, killing that uh, we need to be able to defend. Um, I am not interested in where a human life starts to um, exist. That's not a winning... When you hear that, that's where people go, well, is that the whole point? Is we're trying to figure out where a, the life begins? Nah, she didn't care. And that's the issue right there. She went on to say some other stuff, and she got a little convoluted about, like, the end of life and, and, and stuff. And it was just like it was all over the place. But when you hear something like that, that's when people jump up and say, there, there you go. There you go. That's the fight right there. 
People don't care. They don't care. You should be able to decide up until the moment it happens, even if it's just like, hey, I'm eight months in this thing. The baby could survive without me. And that's the thing that the right is going to make a, a play on is, look, and this is why they want courts to decide, when do you think life begins? Give us that date. Is it 15 months? Is it 12 months? Is it 18 months? And then we can go from there. 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. Teeth, vitally important. Older you get, did you know that your teeth can shift? What? You don't want to wear braces. Those are... No. I'm happy to tell you about Candid. The clear alternative to braces, right? So what they have, Candid has orthodontists who are licensed in your state. They're going to create a treatment plan for you. And they've even got a 3D preview of what your final results are going to look like. And it is incredible. Other companies use dental professionals. They use orthodontists. And you're going to get this 3D printout, right, of what everything's going to look like when you're done. And then, boom, they go to work. And you're going to get custom clear aligners. They're going to be sent directly to you. No hassle of going to the orthodontist's office. Much less expensive, 65% less expensive than braces. So you're going to save thousands of dollars. You're going to have straighter, whiter, brighter teeth, and it's going to happen fast in less than six months. What? One step away from that million, billion dollar, straighter, brighter smile. This is what I want you to do. I want you to use my dedicated link, save some money, go to candidco.com slash Benson. You're going to learn more. You're going to save yourself 75% off. That's CandidCo.com slash Benson. CandidCO.com slash Benson. At Chad Benson Show. Twitter, C-H-A-D-B-E-N-S-O-N. Chad Benson Show. Don't let the Washington Beltway strangle you. This is where the exhausted majority comes to refuel, realign, and reevaluate. This is Chad Benson. Now think about this for a second. You get your phone bill, and then you got to pay it. But there's a caveat. Tens of pages long. This is the phone bill Nadine Spear received. The Canadian businesswoman was asked to pay 61,000 Canadian dollars, more than 40,000 euros, for calls she claimed she didn't make. Like that's my annual salary. That's my, I would have to mortgage my house to pay it. Like, I'm, I'm really trying hard to stay calm about this because I can't believe that there isn't another solution and that I'm, as a consumer, I'm so vulnerable that I could just get a bill and, and everybody gets to go, sorry. Sorry, eh? Hey, but good news is chances are the Raptors are going to win tonight, so you guys are going to be world champions. I know that doesn't take away the fact you have a $40,000 phone bill, but uh, it's expensive. Yeah, $40,000, and normally you'd be like, come on. You know, look, I, it's been 200 bucks, 100 bucks every month. Now it's 40000 Don't you think something's going on here? Her phone company, Bell MTS, insists she must pay the bill for the calls mostly made to Cuba and the Philippines. Obviously, it's illogical. It's not, I don't even think, like, a, a reasonable person couldn't look at this and, and think that a person's actually sitting making phone calls. Experts say it could be the work of professional hackers. You think? You think? Where's the common sense where you go, ah, oh, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real, but it's real. It's real. 40,000. Remember when I was younger, I had a few phone bills that were up there because it wasn't like it is today where you have all these apps and voice over IP and all this kind of stuff. And so I would talk to my friends in Europe and back and forth. And sometimes my phone bill was like $600. And I was like, oh, my God. And I've had a few up there when it comes to like cell phone bills back when there was data plans. You're like, you've gone over your minutes. Oh, my God. But nothing like that. But I, I will say this. My little brothers who who will grab a phone and they will like when they were younger, younger, and they would try to download something and they would charge you for it like a video game. And then it wouldn't go fast enough. And so they download it like 40 times. And my aunt would get a bill. And she's like, oh, my God, the bill's like fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars. Yeah, that can happen. So you got to watch that. But no, really, this lady's got a forty thousand dollar phone bill. And you're not going to do anything about it? 323-538-2423. At Chad Benson Show is your Twitter. You could tweet at us. Again, tariffs done. But how long will they last? 
the non-tariff deal, if you will. A senior White House official tells me that during negotiations, a verbal agreement was made to buy more U.S. agricultural products, but with no specifics. Mexico is already the second largest importer of U.S. agricultural products, and the agreement that was made to stop tariffs from going to effect expires in 90 days so this will be interesting to see for all of the talk and everybody freaking out over this that oh look it's like a deal's done this thing is only done for 90 days and then they'll revisit it so we could be right back here again 323-538-2423 at chad benson show is your twitter you can tweet us here's your useless information of the day you ready for this buffalo 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 is grammatically correct as a sentence why three distinctive meanings Buffalo is New York, right? So you got Buffalo, New York. You have a verb in being buffalo. So buffalo by somebody. And a noun, buffalo's a bison. Isn't that weird? This is why the English language is so tough. Have a great rest of your Monday. We'll do it again tomorrow. Night, night, Jack. This is the Chad Benson Show.